Hello, everybody. Uh, I am Eduardo Arce Diaz, the manager of GASEL, and I have the privilege, the pleasure to host this uh, Action Network uh, parallel presentation session. I hope that uh, you are all uh, enjoying the MSP meeting that we have planned for you this week. And really, we are very thankful with all of you that you know have been working hard to make this meeting really productive. So we will start with our sessions today. And I will just uh, ask you for a few small uh, things that will be important for us. Uh, we are going to have four presentations in this breakout room. And we hope that uh, all of you will use only 30 minutes in general and that we'll allocate some time in within these 30 minutes for questions and answers from the public, from the audience. This time we're in a Zoom environment, so it's going to be easy to collect uh, as, you, as you decide uh, the views and the uh, opinions of, of, the, of, of the audience. And second, that uh, everybody will have uh, access to voice and to chat, but the presenters will decide whether or not they use uh, these uh, facilities or these capacities. So please follow the instructions of your presenters. And this way we will be able to uh, have a, a really good session today. I also would like to ask each of the presenters to kindly submit a very short, brief summary of your main points that you will communicate today so that you can help us with the summary we need to provide uh, the organization. So thank you very much. I'm going to proceed to introduce the first uh, presentation. This presentation is from the action closing the efficiency gap. And the title of the presentation is closing the efficiency gap, action networks report and receiving outcomes. The speaker is Rogerio Mauricio from the Federal University of Sao Joao de Rey, Brazil, who is the coordinator of this action network. I know other speakers will also you know, participate and Rogerio will present them uh, as appropriate when it is time. So thank you very much, Rogerio. The floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Eduardo. I, I'd like to ask the, the participants to send the question by the chat that will be easy for us to answer later on. I share my screen. So is it okay for all? Can you see? Yes. yes. Yeah. Just make it in presentation mode. Yes, thank okay. you. So thank you very much for this opportunity. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to talk a, a little bit about the work that we are doing, the Close the Efficiency Gap Action at Work. And also I, I present the report, the, the activities that we are doing. And also I talk a little bit about the resilience. We have opportunity to talk a bit, uh, about the resilience seminar outcomes. So we have four elements of the current, current action plan, action network operation management, efficiency matrix exercise. We are also doing pilot projects and evidence. And the, the, the later one is communication strategy. Start, starting for the first one, operation management, we are trying to reactive action network stakeholders through a visibility strategy and get in contact with several action network, a global network on civil pastoral system, LEAP, academy research. We are in contact with clusters, social movements, and also other institutions like Daily Sustainability Framework and the Brazilian Center for Sustainable Livestock. So in terms of institution and partners, CIPAV accepted to be part of our group. We are talking with Alianza de Pastizales e Pastor America. We are also in contact with Pablo Flere to be if they joined us. The Pastoral League in India accept to be part of the team. We are pleasure to receive also the acceptance from the Michigan State University, Jenny Hubot, that you have opportunity to, to, see, to talk with her later. 
And also we are waiting for the Resilience Alliance to be part of the, our action network. Probably in a few weeks, you receive the answer. And the Daily Sustainability Framework, Brian Linsett already accept to be part of us. So please, if you, if you need to contact us to join, it would be a pleasure to receive your names. In terms of the efficiency matrix, the, in, during the phase one, was mainly the, the matrix was mainly dealing with animal and land use, productivity in their economical performance. Some but now some elements of animal welfare and environment were introduced, like greenhouse gas. But we need to include the resilience indicators, and that's our task. The phase two, we are planning to identify and select those methodologies involve two major aspects, green, greenhouse gas and water use. And for that, we are, have a joint work with the daily sustainability framework. So in terms of pilot project and evidence, we did a study in Brazilian, using a Brazilian beef production system in Maranhão State, when we use the civil pastoral system on the right side as a model to apply the matrix. And of course, we compare this with monoculture of brachiaria. This is a situation that happened in Brazil. We applied the methodology agribenchmark model for evaluation, economic aspects, and greenhouse gas. We involved several institutions, our actual network, the Tuning Institute, agribenchmark, global, global civil pastoral system network, my university and the Brazilian Center for Sustainable Livestock. The publication was accepted and will be released at the end of the year during the International Rangeland Congress. But we need to go further and we are trying to identify a possible case study. We have one farm in Brazil, in, in Minas Gerais state. This farm has a civil pastoral system composed by natural regeneration of native trees. We have native pasture lands in that area. The milk and cheese production is the main uh, uh, products from there. And this cheese has a unique terroir. Thanks for this French uh, word. No agrochemical use. And please, if you need to, to see more information, visit our uh, film or video in the expo hall. This is just some, some pictures about the farm, you have native grasses, you have trees, a farmer, cattle, and a special teas. Communication strategy. Um, our strategy is based on seminars and publications that come, up, come from the case studies. Um, regarding to the seminar, Resilience in Livestock Sector, that we did in February 2021, we got 200 57 participants from 46 countries. The discussion was initiated in Gaza, but it's important to see that even in COAG, and also we see this, uh, this discussion about resilience in the Food, Summit, Food Security Summit, Building Resilience, I think it's track four or five. We created a working group and the main elements and parameters of the resilience in livestock were identified, ob obviously in the gazo context. We are working on the method methodology. It's not a very easy task, but we are keen to solve this problem. We have a list of indication indicators that we already got from the, the seminar. And the closed efficiency gap is aimed to incorporate those in the efficiency matrix. Regarding to the publication, we have finalized a paper about resilience in livestock system that we, which will be submitted to Gezo Secretariat soon. We have this paper, as I mentioned before, about the Brazilian study that will be published in the end of the year. So we have a, a special moment today to discuss a little bit further about our last seminar. So I kindly would like to invite Jane Hodbob from Michigan State University and also member of the Resilience Alliance to talk a little bit about resilience in livestock. 
And also, it's a great pleasure, pleasure for me to, to receive here Bernard Roubert. He is an emeritus senior scientist in Ra, in France, and also professor of the School of High Studies in Social Science in Paris. He will talk about functional integrity and how it differs to resource sufficiency. So, ladies first, I am Jane, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rogerio. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Jenny Hodbod, as Rogerio said. I'm going to just give you a brief overview of how we have been discussing resilience in livestock systems, both in the webinar and thus in the uh, report that's coming out of it for the, the Gazel paper. Um, so resilience is the capacity of a system to respond to change, and we usually talk about that through either adaptation or transformation. The intention of resilience is really to maintain desirable system identities, which generally are a product of how systems are, um, the pieces within systems and how those pieces are structured and related to each other and what functions that supports. One of the um, uh, pieces of resilience that I think is a kind of contribution in the last 10 years of integrating more social sciences is that we know a lot of our systems are often resilient in an undesirable way. So we have degraded lands that are very hard to um, change the ecosystem out of that degraded state. It's a resilient state, but not one that supports thriving livestock systems potentially. So what the, the resilience framing we are using is trying to demonstrate is how is a system resilient and what type of um, system is being maintained through that resilience and do you have the capacity to actually change the resilience into something that supports a more desirable regime? So in a resilient system that is um, in a, a desirable livestock system, there's a few different actions that demonstrate resilience. The most kind of reactive form is, for example, in dealing with some kind of drought or weather event or pest or um, change in pasture. You might change your rotation patterns. This is a fairly reactive response that doesn't require a lot of additional resources or time or knowledge. A more intermediate form might be having to introduce new um, forms of enterprises like agrotourism or adding a new value added product with the cheese example that Rogerio just mentioned. And then the kind of furthest form of this is a much more prescriptive approach that requires more planning. So for example, purchasing new land or moving to be able to continue your livestock operation. A system that isn't resilient, a livestock system that isn't resilient in particular, wouldn't be able to cope with these types of changes or shocks and would potentially, um, you know, move out of livestock and, for example, go bankrupt with repeated droughts or such. So with a grounding in resilience theory, what we've been thinking about within the seminar and within the report is how do we actually first understand the resilience of our livestock systems? and then start to assess it um, and understand resilience so that we can actually build resilience. There's quite a lot of theory on this that I don't need to cover today, it's in the report, but the one, the the one piece I wanted to flag is that a real uh, principle of resilience is diversity. Diversity creates redundancy in the system and backup plans which form our, our types of insurance. We know that in our livestock systems, diversity is embedded within them. For example, if you think about pastoralist systems, there's diverse um, access to different types of land and grazing, there's diverse kinship and social networks, there's diverse livelihood strategies. So one of the ways to try and support resilience is to support that diversity. And if you're not quite sure how resilient your system is, a first step in trying to operationalize that and understand the diversity in your system is a guiding question of resilience of what, to what, and for whom. So often the of what for our focus is fairly straightforward. It's the livestock system we're interested in, but that could be at multiple scales. It could be an individual farm. It could be the value chain. It could be a kind of you know, global kind of uh, dairy system, for example. The to what often means that we want to think about a specific type of disturbance. Are we interested in resilience to drought? Uh, is it price shocks? Is it COVID, etc. And then the for whom is important because there's multiple different actors in our livestock systems. If you think about the value chain, you've got producers, processors, distributors, retailers. So we want to understand how each group is affected by the shock. One caveat I will offer is that my framing of resilience that I've been trying to share more about, we don't measure resilience and quantify it because by boiling it down, you lose that system's perspective. 
But what we can offer is a case study based approach that integrates multiple different forms of information. And that's where the indicators that Rogerio mentioned are really important because we want to make sure that the things that are important to us in our livestock systems, we have data on and we can look at um, how they're changing over time. So in our report, we have a first attempt at a list of key indicators that will help us understand the resilience of livestock systems. And I look forward to continuing to work with the group to, to build on that list of indicators. So I think the, the question I would leave you with is, you know, how, how can our livestock systems be managed to ensure that resilient um, that resilience? Um, and I'm going to pass over to Bernard to discuss how that fits with uh, sustainability as well. Thank you very much, Danny. Um, I, I now I, oh, I change these slides for Bernard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rogerio, and thank you for inviting me in your in your session because I'm more personally I'm more committed in AN2 where you are involved too. But um, I really appreciate you invite me here, and I will carry on the pathways opened by Jenny on resilience and by questioning the notion of efficiency. So of course. <clears throat> Closing the efficiency gap, what about pastoralism? It's a fuzzy challenge, taking into account commodities, GHG production, sea sequestration, cultural dimension, and so and so. So I will introduce a reflection about the concept of functional integrity. Next slide, please. So it's clear that today, many agricultural practices are unsustainable and counterproductive because they focus purely on how much resource can be produced and harvested rather than thinking of resources as ever-changing and deeply connected within complex ecosystems. So there is a need to think sustainability as an emergent property of stakeholder environment interactions and not a technical property of the ecosystems per se. Next slide, please. So I, I will use <coughs> two, two, <coughs> two frameworks introduced by Paul Thompson, who is a philosopher, an American philosopher working on, on agriculture, was previously in Texas and now is also in Michigan. I don't, I don't think so. So he compares the traditional way of thinking, which he named resource sufficiency, which is an utilitarian vision of nature, where resources are considered as a given capital, a stock, which is in abundance or renewable or probably critical. When it is renewable or critical to maintain its sustainability in the face of declining resources, the traditional way is either decreasing the rate of resource consumption or increasing the efficacy with which the resource is produced by changing technologies or, as the last, substituting with other resources. It assumes that agroecosystems are simply the sum of the resource creation and consumption parts of that make them up. The relationships between these parts are assumed to be sufficiently stable that they can be ignored. It results in policies that emphasize improving only efficiency. Next slide, please. So, and compared to another way of thinking, which he names, he named fun functional integrity. So we are entering into a co-evolutionary process where the resources are emerging from interactions within the socio-ecosystem. So this to point out, this leads to point out the critical points for functioning. What are the technical and social improvements of the management process regarding a set of activities and altering roles and interactions of the actors? That means in the first but framework, <coughs> the sustainability to, <coughs> it is to maintain as long as possible <coughs> the current situation. In this view, the sustainability is to target where we want to go and to improve the interactions and to achieve these targets and by improving these different technical and social interactions. Then the, the, there is a need for policies that their implementation can take account of local circumstances. There is no universal recipe for everywhere, but <coughs> distributed situations that can be, of course, contextualized and adapted with appropriate monitoring and evaluation process to know where we are and where we are going to, and not just applying the same scheme everywhere. 
And that means also that centralized targets and prescriptions are avoided. We need you, you taking into account singularities, singularities and adaptations. Next slide, please. That's it. <laughs> That's a plea for a conceptual shift from a framework where agroecosystem is a sum of resource transformation and consumption. That's been between capital, technologies, and resources in a stable or foreseeable environment targeting efficiency only and relying on, homog on the homogenization of the production factors to, ma to managing, can say stewarding ecosystem functionalities in order to facilitate ecosystem services like the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, relying on skills and know-how, building capacities to adapting to change in environment, climate policies, value norms, with new concept, dynamics, thresholds, resilience, as Jenny suggested, viability kernels, learning processes, and collective actions, etc., based on the coevolution of a system environment relationships facing uncertainties leading to a long-term food securization that means a process leading to sec food security in a globalized world taking into account global public goods so next slide so what <coughs> next slide please. yes that's been two vision of nature either to do instead of nature that's an industrial process turning into inputs into outputs as to do the world of techne of artifacts, stability, homogenization, and so redu reducing the uncertainty in resource as a stock. Of course, it has the power of techniques, and it is assessed in considering efficiency, either as a transforming spontaneous dynamics to be steered and caretaken. It's doing with, not doing, to, not to do, in place of mm -hmm. the world of the fuzzies, evolving and unpredictable performances. The resources are emerging from interactions. The complexity is an asset. <laughs> and the limits, of course, is the available knowledge. So there is a, least, a, a need of knowledge to, to achieve that. Last, next week, next, please. So what livestock farming for tomorrow? This kind of one, right? universal one. Either, next slide. Something more complex and more diverse that it has been developed. <laughs> And argued by by Jenny. Next, please. So, <clears throat> so maybe keep like von Foster, one of the cyberneticians, say, act always so as to increase the number of choices, and don't go into only one corridor. Next, please. So, so what to do now? Of course, to mobilize researchers and practitioners together to give sense to pastoral societies by listing herders and breeders, by identifying no pathways for research in regard of the streets we are will identify, we are identifying, in order to improve viability, resilience, livelihood, sustainability of livestock systems. And the, the last one. Okay, thank you for your attention. And maybe now the last one, which uh, leads to South America. So really, <laughs> to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernard. It's really fantastic. Um, well, after that, my brain is very is shaken and um, we have a lot of work to do together. So I stopped the share the presentation and um, we have in the chat some uh, uh, one question from Pablo Manzano, he, we would like to wish to do a comment. And Pablo, is it possible for you to make that comment in, in voice? Of course it is, Rogeria. I hope you all can hear me. Well. Totally, please. <laughs> yes. No, my question is on uh, my comment, because it's not a question, it's a comment, it's just to comment to you that we have recently in the in a consortium of different uh, research centers uh, headed by the University of Helsinki and the University of Oslo, but where also the Colorado State University is on board. We have uh, been developing during the last two, three years uh, some work on actually measuring resilience and measuring resilience indicators for um, for pastoralist uh, societies in general. I mean, it's not, it's not uh, livestock 
all of livestock, but just pastoral societies. But I think it's very relevant to the work that is being done in this action network, and also a collaboration that we are now conducting with the League of Pastoral Peoples in uh, in establishing a, a global database on pastoralism data. And I think this is very pertinent to what we are discussing here in this action network can be really useful because our objectives are pretty much aligned. So uh, I think there can be a very fruitful collaboration with other partners within the action network. That was my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yuzi, do you have a comment, please? Yuzi? Oh, I, it's not there. Oh, oh Yuzi, actually, I, I, I tried putting something in the chat, but um, no, I think this is a, I, I'm fascinated by this concept and I really uh, think we need to look into efficiency as you know the predominant paradigm in, in the livestock sector. Uh, it's not going to uh, lead us towards, towards sustainability. I, I'm fascinated by this integ uh, functional integrity approach. So I'm so, very grateful for Bernard. <laughs> thank you, Yuzi. Just to let you know that Yuzi, Pablo, and Jenny are part of uh, co-authors of this paper. And I think that you have good results to present later. Um, uh, I, I also have a question for Bernard and, and Jenny that I put in the chat, not in the chat, in the, in the screen. Just one second, please. I share the slide. It's a question that we, oh, sorry, one second, please. Yeah, can you see? My question for both is, is resilience in sustainability or sustainability in resilience? That's my question for you both. Uh, if you can talk a little bit, Jane, it would be nice. Sure. Um, my perspective is that they are actually kind of parallel um, rather than in each other, I suppose. The, that resilience is a system's property and sustainability is more an outcome of systems. And so ideally we need both, but um, we can have unsustainable systems that are resilient and we can have resilient systems that are not, you know, the, the, that's what Elsie just said about efficiency in our systems is leading to actually kind of ingrained forms of resilience that are very hard to change, but they're not necessarily sustainable. So I think um, the, the framing of functional integrity as a version of sustainability that embeds resilience within it is really important. And the, the piece I suppose to remember is that we also need to track the outcomes of that. I would broadly say related to well-being, whether it's social, economic, ecological, we need to think about all of them and support the ecosystems and the people that our livestock systems support. So we want to make sure we have both resilient and sustainable systems. Thank you. Thank you. Bernard, no, no, For me, re resilience is a framework of thinking for these things as dynamics and balance in non-equilibrium and equilibrium plus. And that is also to, to, to have a, a more dynamic perception of the world and then to know what we have to do, taking into account the different situation we have to face within a, a, a dynamic of the system. So it's also a way to enter into the diversity of situations, the singularity of people, and case studies and issues, and then it's it's not it's not <clears throat> as so, it is not it doesn't exist per se resilience. It's mm -hmm. a way of thinking how dynamics are. The world is dynamic, and how dynamics are working, and how we can make them working in, into an a, uh, an endless <laughs> situation, as some situations are now, or to some things that can jump again to another perspective and things like that. So I think it's a, it's first of all uh, a way of of act of thinking, designing the situation, and then acting. It's not something okay. that exists per se. It's a okay. So the framework for a better thought. Hmm. So thank you very much for both. It's a pleasure to to heard so much important information and also to 
to to to to to be part of our team so special people like you jenny and bernard so i need to close the section because we are exactly in 30 minutes and i know that eduard is very keen to maintain the time thank you very much for all the your participation and all the colleagues that make this time very productive thank you very much indeed and see you later in the next presentations thank you eduardo for that of course thank you rogerio and thank you to all the speakers and participants and uh, we've had a, a lot of activity in the chat i hope that you can still address uh, some of the questions through the chat as we advance in the with the other presentations 